So this is a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, John Wilson for uh, this uh, first uh, webinar um, in 2022. So we are now uh, starting the webinar a series of the GDR of the ResNet GDR. I'll briefly introduce John. Um, so he's a researcher uh, director in nuclear physics at uh, EGC Lab, the new lab created in uh, Orsay uh, at the University of uh, Paris-Saclay, uh, just as the south of Paris uh, in France. He's a scientific coordinator of the Alto Accelerator Facility at EGC Lab, and uh, he also holds a visiting professorship at the University of uh, York uh, in UK. Uh, he's author of uh, more than uh, 190 uh, peer review scientific publication, and his um, uh, research interests include nuclear physics, uh, nuclear structure physics, neutron physics, and energy imaging and uh, biological applications. He obtained his PhD uh, uh, thesis in 95 from the University of uh, Liverpool and uh, has uh, subsequently performed uh, research at uh, McMaster University in Canada. Washington University, uh, St. Louis, uh, USA, the Niels Bohr Institute, Denmark, uh, NCA Saclay in France as a Marie Curie Fellow. And he joined the French uh, CNRS in uh, 2003 uh, and has been working in Orsay uh, since then. Uh, he has directed uh, two major scientific projects at the Alto facility, developing both the LICORN inverse kinematic neutron source and subsequently the new ball uh, hybrid uh, gamma ray spectrometer. He's currently organizer of the New Ball uh, International Scientific Collaboration involving over a thousand research, uh, hundreds of researchers from uh, 37 institutions in 16 uh, different countries. Okay, so it's a real, um, really a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, I uh, leave you the mic now. So thank you very much, John. Well, thank you very much, Jerome, for this kind invitation today. Um, I will uh, try and give an overview of this uh, subject, angular momentum generation nuclear fission, which is actually a, a subject which well, fission was discovered 80 years ago. But this particular um, this particular uh, subject was. Uh, um, has spanned over 50 years of, um, of investigations. So I'll try and um, I'll try and give an overview. But also in the last year or so, there's been a very um, great renewed interest in this topic, and many articles come, came out in a very short space of time. So I'll try and um, try and give some impression of the, uh, the exciting time we're now living in for nuclear fission studies and uh, maybe give some um, suggestions for how things might develop in the future. So just to start very simply, of course, uh, the nuclei that fission are at the top of the nuclear chart, and I will be focusing particularly on the actinide region. Um, this is a very special region of the nuclear chart, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, it's that in terms of if we start simple, the basic nuclear stability, um, there are two forces in the nucleus. The first is the, the protons, uh, the Coulomb repulsion of the protons, which are trying to deform the nucleus and break it apart. And in uh, contradiction to that, there's a nuclear surface tension, which is trying to, all other things being equal, uh, keep it together and uh, uh, keep it to more towards spherical shapes. Now, in the actinides, these two forces are uh, precisely in balance, and they can very be easily be persuaded to, um, with a, either a little bit of energy in terms of the absorption of a neutron, uh, can be persuaded to un undergo an unstoppable shape evolution. That is, that the, the protons start to win, and the deformation increases beyond um, a point of no return, which we call the saddle point, and then a uh, further, when the nuclei split apart, we call this the scission point, that's as in a pair of scissors when the nuclei cut. So the process is um, 
rather uh, rather interesting because it represents a dramatic rearrangement of nuclear matter. Um, the initial interest, of course, was the chain reaction. So the 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 major observables which were measured were to do with the probability of uh, the reaction occurring, and in oops, uh, particular the number of neutrons which were emitted, which are thought to be evaporated from the hot fragments. What's least understood about the process is the uh, is the last stage, uh, which is the emission of prompt gamma rays, and uh, here. These can contain information about the angular momentum uh, in, in the fission process. And it was suspected since the 1960s that the, uh, the fragments actually emerged spinning because the multiplicity was measured to be around eight gamma rays per fission or four from each fragment. Um, and if this is, this is shown to be true, I'll show you in the next slide, with this uh, uh, very ingenious tabletop experiment um, by J.B. Wilhelm et al., where indeed he's showing with the first available germanium detectors at the time, this was a new technology, a one centimeter cubed detector, um, a Californium spontaneous fissioning source, and uh, three fission fragment detectors at different angles. So this, from the time difference between the arrival of the gamma rays and the arrival of the fragment, you can get information on the mass or the, the time of flight um, and the mass. From the difference in the angle, you can get the angular correlations between the gamma rays and the fission fragments. And indeed, he was seeing that uh, you could populate certain friction fragments up to about spin, uh, observed to spin eight. Um, this is quite remarkable because in California, the spin starts off as zero, spin zero, yet the both fragments uh, can be populated up to spin eight is quite a puzzle because it seems that nature has created something from nothing. Angular momentum is a conserved quantity and it's, um, it's not clear how this springs into being, if you like. This is, uh, this is a, um, a puzzle for physics. And... Um, his conclusions in this paper were that the average spin per fragment um, was around seven plus or minus two h bar, and that from the angular correlations, the angular momentum must be orientated in a plane perpendicular to the fission axis. So, um, in the meantime, there were plenty of theoretical explanations of why how this angular momentum came into being. Um, I just give us a non-exhaustive summary of the theoretical papers, uh, as, as I said, spanning over five decades on this, on this subject. Um, so this is continuing up to a fully microscopic theory, um, energy density functionals and so on today. Uh, but in the past, the main focus on is what I call these precision modes. This is a conjecture that is uh, no one, there is no experimental evidence that these exist, but they may or may not be a useful theoretical con construct. Um, we'll see in a minute a bit more about those. But the idea is the following that the, um, certainly with the bending, which was first proposed in 1969, you would have the two fragments uh, roll off each other. And, and you can see this in the, in the diagram on the right by this uh, theor theorist uh, artist view, if you like. This is in the context of ternary scission, but you, you get the idea there's an axial symmetry breaking and the two fragments roll off each other. Uh, so they may have different moments of inertia, these J's, um, and, uh, but the, um, the conserved quantity is angular momentum. So I1 will equal minus I2 in this case. The spins will be equal and opposite and they will give rise to a symmetric spin distribution as a function of mass. Um, so back to experiment, what, what do we measure then? If we can measure this spin distribution as a function of mass, this must contain very important information on the problem. Um, so the, the several attempts by several different methods have been uh, used to um, to try and measure this, and this is a uh, this is uh, very interesting. Oops. 
series of experiments, the first uh, Armbruster et al. in 1971, again, a very ingenious uh, experiment uh, for this time neutron induced fission where a neutron beam comes through a collimator. There's a uranium-235 target in the middle of this huge iron disc. Um, in in uh, blue are the fission fragment detectors and in red are the gamma detectors. So they're trying to physically separate the fragments. One goes one way, it's assured that it's going to the detector. The other goes to the other side of the collimator out of view of the gamma detectors. And then he again gets the time of flight information. Uh, so some mass sensitivity, well, some sensitivity, some resolution in uh, fission fragment mass. And then uh, looking at the gamma yield without the collimator and then with the collimator. So the only difference is the collimator. So this must gamma rays coming from one fragment and this is from both. And you can see the emergence of these sawtooth patterns in the gamma ray yield or multiplicities. And um, this, these experiments were confirmed by Pleasanton et al, John et al in other fissioning systems. So this looks very promising. Um, until 1989, this paper by Glasser et al, uh, using again uh, another technique, which is exploiting the rel relativistic headlight effect. That is, if you have a relativistic source, which a fission fragment is moving around um, four or five percent the speed of light, you get a slight focusing of the photons which are emitted from the source in the lab frame in the direction of travel and a defocusing away from the direction of travel. So if you can identify the fission axis and a cone in which gamma rays are uh, detected in the lab frame, then you can apply this uh, relativistic formula to, to attempt to subtract off the gamma rays going from the other, uh, the gamma rays coming from the other fragment going away um, and to get a, a yield as a function of mass for, the, for only one fragment. And here, the measurement showed that there was the distribution was flat. Um, and then he spends half the paper trying to explain why the other guys must have been wrong. And uh, the, his, his uh, hypothesis is essentially that uh, the deficiency in the previous experiment is that you cannot capture the fastest gamma rays because the fragments have not flown apart sufficiently uh, in space. And you cannot capture the slowest gamma rays. So you're left with only about 70% of the yield. And thus the sawtooth, he claims, is an uh, artifact of the uh, time gates in the experiment, both slow and fast. Now, the, uh, the, the uh, last uh, way of trying to estimate the, uh, the spin distribution of function mass is through isomeric yields. And here there's been a number of experimental efforts uh, measuring different isomers and so on. And this is still a, a useful technique, although it is very model dependent if you want to turn an isomeric yield ratio into, a, into an average spin. Just to give you a, an idea, uh, the, the isomer itself is a delayed decay, which you can uh, separate out very easily from the prompt using a, a time resolution of the system, or uh, in some cases actually measuring directly the, the isomer mass, uh, which is different from the ground state mass. Uh, you're measuring the amount that goes below the isomer, sorry, sorry, above the isomer and the, divided by the total feeding of the, of the nucleus, which gives an isomeric yield ratio. And then you can transform this into an average spin if you assume something about the spin distribution at scission. The, the problem, though, is, of course, only a subset of all the fission fragments have isomers. They have a very different nuclear structure sure depending on what isomer you're looking at some isomers are uh, the, the phenomenon of isomerism is, is complicated there's k isomers the spin traps and so on uh, it, it, it's it's not clear that they can all be compared on the same plot and indeed there's no uh, there's no emerging trend at all and in indeed there's some contradictions even in the same mass region you're getting very very different values uh, for the depending on which isomer you're talking about. So the more needs to be uh, done in this regard, but at least uh, this is interesting information, very spin sensitive information. So this was this experimental situation. Um, and uh, I just mentioned our experiments, recent experiments in 2018, where we were also investigating this effect 
with a new bowl spectrometer. And here uh, we, at the Alto facility, built this um, hybrid spectrometer, um, which is a fully digital and we could be coupled to the Lecron neutron source, which allows for the first time a very high resolution, high efficiency spectroscopy of fast neutron induced reactions. Um, so these react these um, these fission reactions we could do with a, a, a mass of tens of grams of fissile sorry of actinide material. In this case, it was either thorium or uranium, uranium two thirty eight or thorium two two thirty two. You have a primary beam of lithium which impinges on a hydrogen target, so this emits neutrons in uh, in a cone. Uh, so you've got the directionality of the of the neutrons, and you can put the source, put the sample very close to the neutron source, and uh, um, with the secondary beam of neutrons, and then create a reasonably high fission rates. And this this is a principle which has taken us about ten years to develop fully, but now we think we master it. Uh, and this was used in the in the series of experiments over uh, seven weeks in 2018. So I'll just show uh, some spectra from these experiments. And um, this, 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 if you're looking at uh, the spin in fission, you want to be measuring prompt decay only. So what is essential here and, and different to previous experiments with, for example, Californium source in arrays, we were tagging one fragment with an ionization chamber to be certain we have a fission because we don't want to mix beta decay and fission in the same process. We'd have two population mechanisms and this would uh, screw things up because beta decay is uh, populating at much lower spin. We want only the prompt decay. So the, the problem is solved for uranium-238 and thorium by the pulsation of the neutron beam. Um, so uh, here we have the three spectra of the same nucleus, xenon-140, gated on the 2 to 0 transition. And the What's remarkable is that the spectra are very, very similar, um, even though the partner of the, that emerges with Xenon 140 differs in mass by around 25%. We'll come back to that uh, phenomenon later, but you can see in the spectra by eye that they, they look very, very similar and don't appear to depend on the positioning system at all. There is a method that was developed in the 1980s by the group at Manchester University where you can actually attempt to measure, to combine all the spectral information here and, and attempt to measure an average fin. And this is what we were exploited in our work. And the original article is Abdul Rahman et al. This was Bill Phillips' uh, group at Manchester that worked all this out. But I'll just illustrate the principle here. This, these are figures taken from their original paper. The idea is at each level, each observed level, you're measuring an intensity of gamma rays into the level and out of the level. And you obtain uh, a difference between the two, which is the side feeding for the state. So for the simple example I've drawn here, you're measuring the, the blue arrows and then you're deducing the green arrows which are feeding this. So you get a distribution of spin at or near the rest line. And then you want to transform that or um, um, into a, a distribution of spin um, before the neutron emission, at least. And to do that requires understanding the statistical gamma rays. So the, the question then is how many, uh, how much delta I, when you come in just below the neutron binding energy down to at or near rest, how many units of angular momentum do you lose in this process? Because we need to add that back. And uh, so this was. Uh, um, some let's say a small model dependency the the idea is that you need to to simulate cascades you come in at the neutron binding energy the nucleus wants to lose energy primarily not angular momentum so the first the first step is neutron emission and uh, the literature says that that's a, a small uh, contribution to uh, so, so a small amount of angular momentum is lost through that and then uh, the statistical gamma rays, there's, uh, there's more which is lost through that. So there's E1 transitions, which the easiest way to, to lose a lot of energy quickly uh, is the predominant mode of decay. 
And of course, the selection rule, it can use, it can lose one, one unit or it can go up, up one unit in spin. Um, the, there's a slight preference for a step down just because the level density here, there are more final states available at I, I minus one for the same energy than there are for I equals zero, or I plus delta I equals plus one. So there's a slight walk downhill and uh, this, uh, the average, what this shows is typically is two to three gamma rays in each uh, statistical cascade, taking them around one H bar in spin. And this is a similar to the results which uh, the Manchester group are using with their cascade code. Um, we'll see that this assumption later on is perhaps an underestimate, um, but that's, I'll, I'll deal with that in a, in a second. Okay, so we can measure then for each nucleus we can observe through the each even even nucleus we have observed, we can measure a spin distribution at or near ERAST and from that extract a, an average spin for that. And the result then is this, this set of curves which we published in 2021, the principal result. Uh, so measuring for 30 even even nuclei in each, in each nucleus. Um, we see definite sawtooth patterns which have a slope and a curvature. The heavy peak has higher spins than the light on average. And there are some comments. Firstly, this is in entirely consistent or, uh, with what Armbruster and Pleasanton and so on saw in the early 70s, and they, I, they were not wrong with their sawtooth patterns. Uh, also, there's no notable dependence on the partner nucleus. Um, so it seems that each nucleus that has a spin, it does not care with the, uh, it does not care about the mass of the partner which it emerged with. That, that seems quite remarkable. Um, and then look at the, it's not a symmetric distribution at all. It's highly asymmetric distribution. So you've got certain partners which have very large asymmetries. If you take the example of cerium 150 here, it has twice the spin of its uh, partner, uh, selenium 86. So how does that happen on an event by event basis? How is it on average that the spin is twice that in one fragment than it is in the partner? Um, it seems uh, contradictory to the conservation of angular momentum to say the least. Um, so then on an event by event basis, uh, you, it's possible to actually measure the average spin you can look at the correlations between fragment partners. And here is an example of the xenon again, where instead we're not looking at the xenon gamma ray lines, but we're looking, we're zooming in on the partner, which is the strontium 96. Uh, so if we gate on xenon 2 plus, xenon 4 plus, 6 plus, and 8 plus, and so on, and look at the, um, look at the uh, strontium 96 lines, the spectrum is surprisingly invariant. And if we, if we actually fit all these peaks and measure the average spin in the strontium fragment, uh, the result is that there's no observable correlation at, at or near your ast of the two fragments. The, the one fragment does not know on an event by event basis what the spin was in the other fragment. Seem to be completely independent, or at least we observe no, no, uh, no dependence of the one on the other. And this was very, this was very perturbing to me because I was very much expecting a correlation. I just wanted to know what the correlation was. What what was the slope on this graph? What what would it be? It turns out the slope is uh, consistent with zero, and this also is a part of the puzzle. It's uh, it's not clear uh, why this was happening. So. Um, our first thought was, well, this might be an artifact of uh, the statistical decay. What about the neutrons and the statistical gamma rays in each fragment which arrive before their erast states are reached, supposing that the dispersion, that is the random walk that on, occurs on the way down in each fragment as all this energy is emitted, uh, supposing that is enough to uh, to uh, destroy a correlation which happens at scission, so that the, the fragments can be correlated at scission, but it's simply an artifact of the um, statistical decays washing out the correlation. 
So to do that, we had to uh, uh, write a Monte Carlo code to understand spin dispersions. And here is the code, uh, here are the distributions we use. So we, we use quite a broad delta i distribution from the, from the gamma rays, which are direct from the, uh, from the Rainier Monte Carlo House of Feshbach simulations. The neutrons we're supposing a, a plus or minus delta i of uh, plus or minus half, plus or minus a half for each neutron. Um, so uh, again, this is this was our initial estimate, um, seemed consistent with what the literature was saying. And uh, so you can gate on, do the experiment with fully correlated spins of scission. And then gate on the partner and project out uh, what you ought to observe for fully correlated spins at scission. We're just supposing that they're fully correlated, and you can see that there is an effect, or there would be a strong effect, that the uh, the spin distribution just moves up um, if you select being more and more strict on the gating condition. And this is not what we observe. So the conclusion of these simulations is that, of course. Dispersions, the, 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 the more you, you broaden these distributions, the more this, uh, this co correlation of decision are weakened. It takes a hell of a broad delta I for the neutrons and gamma rays to, to destroy them completely. It, um, so then the conclusion is that we have a correlated spins, um, correlated spins are pre-scission mechanism and uncorrelated spin, spins are a post-scission mechanism. This was our conclusion. It was not just based on the independence of the fragments, but also the fact that the fragment doesn't appear to care, care about the mass of the partner, which it would probably do if it was joined together. If the motion which generates the angular momentum is started pre-scission, then the two fragments are joined together and you would expect some kind of uh, dependence on the partner mass, which we don't observe. Um, so then how about the glassal result? Well, one suggestion, um, uh, this may or may not be correct, is that the glassal result came about because he did the analysis in an event by event way. That is for this four pi uh, gamma detector, you could have the cone defined for each event and counting a number of gamma rays in each in each direction forwards and backwards and then doing a doppler correction on that but there is a hidden assumption here in that event by event of course if the spins are independent then the correction is inappropriate so if if this was done event by event and it's not clear from the way the articles were worded the the you, you would expect you would not expect to see a sort of you would expect to see a flat pattern which is exactly what uh, is observed so this 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 would then confirm the the idea of the independent spins uh, before i go into an explanation um I would just want to say a word about axial, spontaneous axial symmetry breaking in nature. This is a very interesting and widespread phenomenon. Uh, the classic example is the pencil balancing on its point that a tiniest fluctuation in one direction or another causes an unstoppable uh, fall under gravity in one direction. And the, and the direction in which it falls is completely unpredictable. Same goes for two bar magnets. Uh, when you push them together, I, I imagine everyone's done this as a kid, right? You push them towards each other. Uh, they do not want to align. There will be a, they, will, they will split or they will disalign in a way which is completely random, if you like, in, the, in terms of the direction. And, and again, an unstoppable uh, small difference in the alignment will, will become larger and larger. Uh, the last two uh, rotations are involved. The, uh, the, the one is the, the water going down a bath plug. Uh, the, the myth is that it's the Coriolis force which uh, causes the, the water to spin one way or the other. In fact, this is not true. It, it, the, it's supposed to be in Australia, the water goes down the opposite way to in Europe because uh, it's south of the equator. It turns out that the Coriolis force is so weak that it, it has no bearing on whether the water goes down in one direction or another. Rather, it's the tiny imperfections, tiny little fluctuations or deviations from the axial symmetry that then start a rotation which is um, 
uh, which becomes larger. And then the last example, which was actually inspired our, oops, uh, our, our thinking on the position mechanism was uh, this neutron star um, binary system, where here again, you've got an axial flow of material uh, which is accreted to the neutron star. And it's actually, you can actually measure this or there are astronomical observations of clumps of matter falling into the neutron star and the, the, the pulsar frequency increases as a function of time. But it's thought there's an accretion disk which has a definite spin because of the off axis uh, component of the, of the, um, of the, uh, of the um, material which falls into it. So just bearing that in mind, this is what we suggest. And again, this is, I want to be quite clear, this is a suggestion or a conjecture. Um, it's an attempt to explain our data. It doesn't mean that it's a reality. It's something that we um, propose, if you like. So the proposition is this, that slightly off axis motion of the ruptured neck nucleons between the two system drives the angular momentum generation. Um, Position. That is that once the nuclei split apart, that is when the angular momentum is set uh, as two independent torques, that is uh, R cross P. In the, in the two fragments, you can have an R in any direction uh, and a P. And there's an implied third torque, that is, um, the, which has a small R and, sorry, small P and large R, the R in this case for the being about the center of mass of the system and as we'll see in a moment is the orbital angular momentum of the system. Um, so the idea is that the shell effects in TIN-132 in particular are very dominant in fission. They're about 4 MeV in size and you can suppose a cluster where you can divide the nucleons in the, in the fissioning system into uh, two clusters, one sort of TIN-132 like, TIN like and the other nickel-178 like. And then the deformation at scission um, is, is uh, related to where, this, where the uh, rupture occurs in this neck. Uh, as the system is being stretched, there will be a random position in which the neck ruptures, um, which is not the case classically, of course, it would split at its weakest point. And then it gives rise to a sawtooth pattern in the um, in the um, average spin or um, so it is the idea is that the surface deformation energy is at a maximum at scission and then once the rupture occurs there's a relaxation very quickly uh, and the the this uh, surface deformation energy converts into internal excitation energy of the fragments but some of this actually gets converted into rotational language of the fragments as well uh, so the, then the energy partition between fragments, the deformation uh, is all related to the point of neck rupture, i.e. the number of nucleons which end up in each fragment, the number of valence nucleons above the closed shell. Um, so how is angular momentum conserved in this picture? And why are the fragment spins in a particular event uh, independent? These are two uh, unresolved questions. The idea is the following, that if these small, the, the small off-axis components, um, it's a, a spontaneous axial symmetry breaking, if you like, and then you've got this implied third torque which generates an orbital angular momentum. The, uh, um, the analogy is the teacups ride in Disneyland, where you've got two cups which are joined on a base plate. So if they're free to spin independently, but the orbital angular momentum is uh, conserves the total because it's the sum of not two vectors, but three. So for Californium 252, for example, which starts with zero spin, then you get uh, the sum of these ve three vectors and angular momentum conserved. And because um, you have this orbital angular momentum accompanied with an orbital energy, which will be low because the moment of inertia is, is large, um, this implies that the fragment angular momentum can will lie in the plane perpendicular to fission axis, but there won't be any constraints on their directions. And then in this case, the largest possible angular momentum 
would be I1 plus I2, which in the case of two fragments, which have spin 14, 16, at the, uh, this means that you're getting angular momentum the order of uh, 30. Uh, orbital angular momentum can be very large indeed, but it's, uh, it's inferred. So there's no experimental constraint on that at the moment. The smallest possible will be the difference between the two. Um, so we wanted to find a parameterization which could describe the data and uh, contain some physics. And here we um, asked for help from Sven Olberg and Olivier Siro, two well-known theorists who, who read the paper and were um, both suggesting very similar idea. Um, I, I should say I should say on these last two transparencies, by the way, that. Um, this is a very simplistic and schematic picture. It's not intended to, in any way to be uh, the, a, a full theoretical description, far from it. It's just that in, in the case of publishing in Nature, you need an explanation which is accessible to the general reader. And uh, in the absence of any theoretical predictions before our work of sawtooth patterns, we had to work um, hard to try and understand why the sawtooth was occurring. And this is, uh, this is the um, parameterization based on this idea of Hans Bethe, the statistical theory, or an attempt to calculate the number of energy levels of a heavy nucleus. He suggests that if you have an excited nucleus, then um, the population of angular momentum states will uh, be based on, in, in this uh, statistical distribution, um, then you can combine it with the um, Fermi gas model. I won't go through the whole, mathematics, but the, um, the idea is that it's, here, is the, here is the main ingredient, is that the excitation is it's, um, what creates the sawtooth is the partition of excitation energy. That is, the system, system configuration sends some energy to the left and some to the right. It's, it's divided up between the fragments, and we say this is just simply proportional to the number of valence nucleons outside the closed shell. So this is, if you like, the an elastic analogy. You've got a stretch piece of elastic, and where you cut the elastic uh, partitions, the energy um, half and half, or two thirds, one third, etc. So that's the uh, that's the um, very simplistic analogy. Um, it also links the spin sawtooth and neutron multiplicity sawtooth. I'll show you that in a minute. Both are dependent on the excitation energy partition. And this is the functional form of the formula, which we're after, which relates to the fragment mass, the uh, number of valence nucleons above the closed shell in each fragment, and the, uh, the average spin. Uh, so it's like a simple formula, like the Weissacker formula for nuclear masses. And um, we'll see how well it fits the data. And it, 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 we have just one free to parameter, the, um, this constant here. And it turns out that the sawtooth curve is uni universal, if you like, to within around 4%. They all, four, the, all these constants are, if we fit the six light and heavy peaks of each fissioning system, we're, we're getting a constant which is remarkably uh, close to the other values. So it seems to... Um, explain the main trends, if you like, of this spin mass, mass relationship. Um, although, of course, there can be uh, some second order effects. Uh, so it also simultaneously parameterizes the neutron sawtooth, because this, in, in this simple picture, would be a, just sim a simple straight line of the number of valence uh, related to the number of valence nucleons. And uh, sure enough, when we fit a straight line and extract the constants from the neutron sawtooths. It's not in the, not in exactly the same systems, but they, there's a universal line instead of a universal cur curve in this case, and they uh, describe the trends to about 10%. So the simple statistical theory also explains the main ingredients of the competition neutron mass relationship. By the way, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with fission, the prompt fission neutron multiplicities have been known since the 1960s to follow this sawtooth shape. And it's maybe not surprising that the gamma rays also follow the same pattern. They're just simply two aspects of the same underlying fundamental phenomenon. So then uh, with, this, uh, with this simple picture, we can go on to make predictions for other systems. 
if we combine it with the uh, known yield information for the fragments and then establish a trend for all the systems, we can then, um, for the light and heavy peaks, we can combine the light and heavy uh, predictions into, um, onto this curve. So we can uh, predict for all the major fissile systems, for example. Um, there's consequences for reactor gamma heating problem, which I don't have time to go into today. Nuclear structure, of course, is very interesting to know in advance which states are accessible through the fission process because fission is used as a major production mechanism for the, um, for the uh, exotic nuclei in many different facilities. So, um, and then the fission itself, if there's no access to precision information from the gammas, this would be rather disappointing. It means it would be sort of forever shrouded in mystery. Um, and then finally, for new mass regions of fission, it might be interesting to invert the problem by measuring spin sensitive data, you might be able to understand better uh, the, the, um, the uh, let's say, shell closures involved in this, this new uh, bit of delayed fission, um, this uh, Andrea F paper. Uh, but so we thought, okay, well, we've, we've, um, we've uh, made a good attempt, let's say, to explain our data. And, uh, but of course, um, what we're not expecting, I guess, it was naive to think that our explanation uh, would be the only one. And there's been in many other subsequent articles by major theory groups in the, in the USA, from Los Alamos, from Livermore, and from Berkeley. And in addition, some experimental results. Um, this is all in the year 2021, all last year. So it's a hugely active field, which uh, has been flagged as very important because there's now uh, four let one nature and four letters, physical review letters and physical review B, uh, physical letters B on this problem. So let's deal with the uh, experimental result results first. This is experiments done using the same technique as Glassel that I described earlier, only this time using gates on, uh, sorry, uh, gamma gated mass yield distributions to extract using, um, using this relativist, relativistic boost in the direction of travel of the fragment, the uh, gamma yield or multiplicity as a function of the fragment mass. And here uh, they've done the experiment uh, right, if you like. The very large statistics, and here you can see the sawtooth pattern the same in the gamma multiplicity as we observe in the average spin, and uh, the curvature as well is also pronounced. And you can see if we overlay for Californium R results and parameterization uh, with the Travar data, we can see it's a very reasonable agreement given they're completely different techniques. Um, we have to assume a normalization of, uh, in, in terms of an average um, angular momentum carried away per emitted gamma. But this is, this is the literature value. I think it's uh, reasonable because some, some gamma rays are E1, some are E2s and so on. So um, the other interesting thing in the Travar paper is, is this. They've me they measured the total kinetic energy of the fragments as well. And here, the total kinetic energy is essentially the, the Coulomb repulsion. That is, um, if you have a total kinetic energy is high, that, that um, the interpretation then would be the centers of charge are very close when the rupture happens and there's more Coulomb energy available to go into the total kinetic energy and less excitation of every energy available and less deformation and less angular momentum. So indeed, the multiplicity goes down by, I guess, around 30, 40 percent. Uh, at the other end, this would be um, an elongated rupture, a larger deformation excision, a larger excitation energy in the fragments, and larger angular momentum, all correlated together. So this is, uh, sort of confirms the same picture, if you like. And now the theories, uh, the the theories are all predicting sawtooth patterns, uh, which they weren't incidentally before, certainly uh, Randrup's last paper, they were not predicting a sawtooth and now they do. Uh, but also the latest uh, microscopic density functional theories of predicting uh, sawtooth patterns, which are consistent with the experimental results.
But the best agreement so far, and this is quite remarkable, is the Los Alamos Code CGEMF, which is uh, the state of the art code of uh, tissue and fragment decay from, um, from Los Alamos. And uh, they seem to do extremely well to explain the, or to, to reproduce the data. Um, now, Randrup, I'll deal with these in, in turn, but uh, the, let's say the most critical of our explanation was Randrup. Um, and they have two major problems with what, we, what, we're, uh, um, what we're suggesting. The first is that just because the spins of the fragments are observed to be independent, uh, the one with the other, does not mean necessarily that the, the mechanism is a position mechanism. That he shows um, that, in fact, you can get the same result pre precision if you um, if you uh, invoke these uh, precision modes that I was talking about earlier, the bending and bending mode, etc. Uh, so they're saying that, that, that our assumption that that the independence of the fragment spins shows position that that's not an evidence for position. And uh, their point is well taken. Um, the uh, the other question is uh, the other criticism is the independent population of raw stateless states in the fragments after their separation seems hard to reconcile with the principle of angular momentum conservation for isolated systems, and um, th uh, that that is that is right. In fact, a fragment can't spin itself, and we're not saying that they do. The, the, of course, an astronaut in space, in the, in the space station, cannot make himself spin by waving his arms about. He has to push off from something. So we're not saying that the fragments spin themselves. Of course, they have to interact, and they're coupled. And we've even stated how they're coupled, which is the sum of the three angular momentum vectors with the organ, um, with the, um, for the conservation of angular momentum. So. Um, um, that, that is perhaps why the mark, but he does also say something positive at the end, which is that the measurements of, uh, of the average spin as a function of mass uh, that we report provide unique experimental information on the fissioning system at the time of scission, which in turn will be very helpful for the further development of fission theory. So it's, it's not all critical. Um, so in his view, the multiple, it's the multiple exchange of nucleons during the neck formation, which uh, drives this uh, precision uh, motion. It's strongly damped, that is dissipative, because uh, the process is, in this, in this view, slow. And that it's uh, this stochastic excitation of two of the six precision modes. This is the uh, bend, bending and wriggling. This was the Moretto originally. Uh, explicited this idea that you have, if you have two spheres which are touching, then mathematically you can describe uh, six different dinuclear modes. Uh, twisting would be, for example, motion around the twisting around the axis, which uh, since the axis is symmetric, then this would not be allowed quantum mechanically. But the bending and bending, you can see how that can arise with um, anti parallel spins. Wriggling is a little bit more complicated. Uh, you've got um, parallel spins and then an uh, orbital angular momentum, which cancels those out going in the opposite direction. And then uh, some more exotic um, versions of these degenerate modes. Um, but I'll just make a comment about the wriggling, which is it's not clear in practice. Th these mathematically describe, you can mathematically describe them, but it's not clear to me how the two fragments can rotate in opposite directions when they're locked together. Uh, the rotation can only start, um, I, I would suggest, after, after the fragments are split apart. But people may disagree with that. Also, it does not address the lack of dependence on the fragment partner mass, uh, the universality of the sawtooth, um, that it, the fragments don't seem to care about the partner, seems an important piece of experimental information. Yet if it was precision, which was doing the motion, then, um, then the system would care about the mass of the partner. But in the end, uh, um, they, they managed to reproduce the experimental data rather well. And in the end, are we actually saying different things? It's maybe just a philosophical um, disagreement. 
here is his calculation for the, uh, for the angle between the spins of the fragments. And it shows it's more or less independent. There's, there's no, uh, the, the direction is more or less random, if you like, depending on the event. Um, and it, it, we're saying exactly the same thing in words uh, in, this, in this picture. Uh, we're pointing a plane perpendicular fission axis, uh, although we no correlation or constraint on the relative orientations. That, that's um, more or less we agree on that. But uh, this paper by Bul Bulgerk et al. just out uh, a couple of weeks ago, they don't agree with uh, Freya calculations. They say no. Um, what results from their calculation, they are predicting very large orbital angular momentum. You remember I was talking about 30H fire uh, as, the, uh, as the limit for the sum of the two fragments. They indeed have that, but they have a correlation in the directions in the fragments. Um, I, I have no strong opinion about these calculations. I don't think I understand them uh, sufficiently well to, to, um, to, to say anything more, but just to alert you, this paper is there for the theoreticians um, who, who may be interested in uh, understanding what they've done. And they come to a different conclusion about the directions that they, this, this is 90 degrees would be 0.5. So this is parallel spins, anti-parallel spins. And they're saying on average, they're somewhere in between those. Uh, so the Los Alamos paper here, is, they make a very important point, I think. They, they're calculating the angular momentum removable by neutral, neutrons and statistical gamma rays. And here, they, uh, their calculations show, and again, I don't have a strong opinion on this, but the angular momentum carried away by neutrons is considerably larger than currently uh, thought, certainly in contradiction to the available literature. That the neutron emission is not S wave, but it has a significant amount of P wave. So the average per neutron is around a delta I of one unit, uh, not significantly less than one as was previously thought. And indeed a dispersion, which is rather large. So this will contribute to, let's say, washing out uh, or um, correlations at scission. But even if we put their very broad distribution for the neutrons in, it still does not destroy fully correlated uh, fragments, um, it, it does not give a false signature for the independent experimental signature. Um, oops. So they're suggesting that the spins of scission, while our data are somewhat representative of, very representative of what happens at the scission in red points, they're saying that there's an extra three units of angular momentum on average in there. and um, this is uh, this this is an important point. I I I think just to say that this means then, yeah, they say that the average spin data alone are in, in, insufficient to fully constrain theory because they only provide a lower limit. Since through average spin we cannot say anything about them, and we do not measure the statistical transitions uh, from the gamma rays, so we don't know experimentally how many there are. We have to rely on a model to tell us. Um, however, we do have the uh, multiplicity, uh, multiplicity experiments as well. And the two together now are needed to fully constrain theory. And we, I just point out this one data point here. They're suggesting, for example, in the TIN-152 region, that uh, at scission there's 10 h bar of spin, but we know that from the multiplicity measurement, it's only two gamma rays on average and half a neutron on average. So it seems this is not consistent with the gamma ray multiplicity data just in this region here, and that the theory and the experiment are wrong by around a factor of two or inconsistent to a factor of two. So more work needs to be done, but I think this is quite a, um, quite a remarkable a a agreement still. And we're in contact with the Los Alamos people, and uh, we, we would like to understand better the modeling uh, so we can make progress to, to, to better understand what's going on. I should say, I would make a general point, it would be actually very good for theory to cross-check with the integral pump fission gamma ray multiplicity measurements that we've been doing over the last 10 years or so. Here is the available data, and we can see that the our average spins uh, if we convert them to gamma ray multiplicity, including the parameterization, 
uh, assuming some reasonable normalization, it doesn't too too bad. But if you applied the same to the theory, they, the, the theories would be uh, rather higher um, that need to be uh, bring down in spin a little to agree with the data. So what next? Um, well, we have a full program, experimental program of the new ball two spectrometer this year, which is just start, we're just starting to construct it. Uh, there's many more fission experiments that can be done. Um, there's uh, not all of the new ball two experiments are fission, but there's some key ones where we want to look at, for example, the propagation of angular momentum in fission. Uh, how does the excitation energy that we pump into the compound system, how does that end up in the fragment? Um, high energy gamma ray emission is something very interesting because this is not uh, this is not understood fully how you can get uh, gamma rays which go way beyond the neutron separation energy so you can potentially populate uh, uh, pygmy or even giant dipole resonances and this is something we're interested in working with Christel Schmidt and, and so on and some experiments uh, very soon with Vamos and Paris at Ganil on this subject. And uh, we're expecting uh, also comprehensive data on that with uh, New World Paris the configuration here. And then also, I think there's more work that can, done, uh, can be done related to the fission shape isomers, which is another topic uh, which is very interesting. Um, so this is currently the status of New World to uh, at Alto, we received the equipment, the detectors, the, the uh, hemispheres to, to mount the, uh, some of the frame and so on. Um, we're, this, is the, this is last week, the picture I took. Um, we're beginning mounting and cabling and so on. And we have around one year to complete the experimental campaign and then they send the detectors back to Eurovascular. Um, and then I just finish with uh, general perspectives that the method that we showed, it's not the, we're not the only ones who've used it. I can show you some results, for example, Bogachev et al, who've used this for heavy iron fission induced reactions. But I would say generally, that's a very much underused technique. It could be exploited much more in the study of nuclear reactions, because it's very sensitive to small changes in spin. And um, for example, uh, why not use it on the, to understand the population, the uh, spin population in super heavy uh, reactions where you can measure side feedings for all these, uh, all these states in the Uras band and, and obtain a spin distribution, which you can then compare with different reaction mechanisms, different reaction conditions to help uh, uh, constrain theory for super heavy population, which might help um, might help uh, understand the, uh, uh, the mechanisms to populate, uh, um, yes, yeah, so super heavy elements is a, an important field. And then finally, of course, uh, why not also these very highly deformed states, this is super deformation, you could do exactly the same. You could make such a, such a measurement and uh, uh, be very sensitive to small differences in spin between reactions. I'll finish then with a um, um, photograph of the Newborn collaboration. Um, it's a great pleasure to be involved with all these very nice people from different laboratories all over Europe and beyond. And um, very grateful to everybody who has been involved with the experiments. And uh, we look forward to a Newborn 2 campaign with some exciting results in the next, in the next year. So I think I'll end there. Thank you very much.